So if you haven't figured it out yet, my name is Nikki Dicky. <laughs> and here's what I'll tell you. I think uh, God definitely has a sense of humor because when I was about 11 years old, I walked over to what would be my sister-in-law on her wedding day, and her name was Starshine, and she was marrying a guy with the last name Shirley. And I walked over when she's in her beautiful white dress at her reception, and I said as a little 10-year-old, ha, 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 you are now Starshine Shirley. And I totally believe that God looked down at me, and he said, guess what? You're going to marry her brother, and you'll be Nikki Dicky for that one, right? Um, Oh, but you know what? I'd marry my husband a million times over to be Nikki Dicky, and I just figure it makes, uh, makes me memorable, right? Um, so today we're talking about being worthy of the search, and this is something that God has laid so powerfully on my heart as I find my worth in Christ. So we're going to start right off the bat with a question, and here's what I want you to discuss as a table. How worthy do you feel for the pursuit of God? One being, hey, I, I don't feel unworthy at all. Like, I feel unworthy. I don't see him anywhere. Ten being, I feel so worthy of God pursuing me, and I see him everywhere. Real quick, we're going to just take a one minute and go around your table and rate how you feel about God pursuing you from a one to a ten. All right, and as we come back together, ladies... I want to tell you just a little story. When I was 13 years old, but this was I knew my husband, but I fell in love with another man. And as any 13-year-old relationship, this was going to be my husband. Anybody else meet your husband when you were 13? So you thought. And I thought, this is going to be a love story that generations are going to talk about. And so I remember before social media and you could post your status updates, I did what you did back then and you took permanent marker and you wrote it on your hand, right? <laughs> I love Mark. And it was all over my folders, Mr. and Mrs. Tony. And I tell you what, I was going to tell the world that I was going to be Mrs. Mark Tony. But you know, I grew up in Indiana in a high school and middle school between four cornfields. So I remember the day when I started walking through those middle school hallways and all of a sudden I heard the little whispers and people staring at me and sure enough, soon I realized that my Prince Charming had another Cinderella on the side. I know, right? And because this relationship was like so surprising, it was like the talk of the school. We didn't have much to do back then. So like um, with the, between the cornfields, so it was like a hot topic. And I remember being absolutely mortified to the point where I kind of fell into like this mini depression. I mean, this was the man I was going to marry. And he cheated on me. And just that feeling of feeling, for the first time, feeling so unworthy and undesired. You see, I grew up in the church. And so uh, my parents, being strong Christians, my mom said, you know what, you need to get away and you need some Jesus time. And so there's a women's retreat that was going on that next weekend, and they needed babysitters. Now, looking back at this memory, I'm going, why in the world would they bring their kids to a women's retreat? I don't know, but they did, right? Uh, my kids are staying at home when I go on this women's retreat for, with Bakersfield for a couple, in a couple weekends. But, um, so they hired babysitters, and I went up there. And the one thing I told my mom is I want nobody to know what I'm going through because I felt like I was the talk of the school, and I just needed to be, I just needed to be Nikki. And so I go up to this retreat, and I remember as like that Saturday session ended and I'm watching the clock tick and I knew those parents were about ready to pick up those kids and I had two hours of free time because I had an agenda. I remember walking out those doors of that cabin where we babysat and I was staring straight at the hiking trail. Now I am not an outdoorsy girl. I have a pair of hiking boots and I'll tell you what, they have been in my closet for about four years and are still in pristine condition, okay? So the fact that I was going towards that hiking trail meant business. Jesus was found in nature, right? That's what they say. The Lord is found in nature. So I was going to go there and I was going to handle business. And I remember walking in that hiking trail to the point where I was out of earshot and I sat down on this log and I I let him have it, screaming, how dare you? Why would you do this to me? I thought you loved me. And believe me, I gave him a piece of my 13-year-old emotional mind. And you know what? Because I was raised in the church, I honestly expected maybe like a burning bush would come up because that's how the Sunday school 
you know, my Sunday school teacher told me, or maybe an animal would come up and start talking to me. Maybe I'd hear him from heaven. But I'll tell you what, I screamed and I hollered and I cried and I got nothing. And I walked back to that cabin that day feeling more empty than when I came. And I remember going back to my, the cabin and thinking, okay, I need to reapply my eye makeup. I can't let anybody know what just happened. And I went back, and I was putting my stuff away, and all of a sudden I looked, and there was this card on my bed, and it was this handwritten scripture. And the moment I started reading it, all the eye makeup I had just applied went running back down my face because it said, since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for for you and nations in exchange for your life. That's Isaiah 43, 4. You see, while I was out giving God a piece of my mind, he was creating this romantic gesture by giving me a handwritten note telling me, Nikki, you are loved. You are precious in my sight. I love you. And, it, and I even took it as, I will give people in exchange for your life. Another the version that I actually received on my pillow said, I will give men in exchange for your life. And I thought, yes, Jesus, you're going to give me the man of my dreams if I give you my life. That is not what that scripture means. But... <laughs> it's exactly what I thought it meant and what I needed to hear in the moment, right? And honestly, I just, that was the first time I felt pursued by God. That was the first time that all this relationship with Jesus, I had walked with him since I was like three or four years old, he became real and I realized he was searching after me. He was pursuing me and he was trying to get my attention and he was waiting till I was done screaming and he wanted to tell me, Nikki, I love you. So, We only are going to do three minutes, but if you can go around your circle and in two or three sentences, just say, when was the first time that you remember God pursuing you? Maybe it was last week. Maybe it was when you were a teenager, but when was the last time that, or the first time that you remember God pursuing you? All right, ladies, we're going to come back together again. And we are going to jump into Genesis 16. So if you have your Bibles, um, we are going to be talking about the story of Hagar. Now, if you are familiar with Hagar, you probably know we don't actually talk about her much. Who do we talk about most? Abraham and Sarah, right? We know them really well. But let me tell you a little bit about Hagar. Hagar was the maid servant of Sarah. In fact, in the scriptures, Sarah only refers to her as maidservant. And most likely, Hagar was probably given as a gift when Abraham and Sarah were going through Egypt. It was very customary for Pharaoh to give them gifts. And so most likely, that's where she came from, and that's why she is with kind of their clan. Now, Sarah and Abraham, which you probably are familiar with, if you remember, Sarah and Abraham were a lot older. Sarah, at the time of when we're going to jump in here at uh, Genesis 16, she is 76 years old and Abraham is 86 years old. They have not had any children, but yet 10 years ago was the last time that God reminded them of the promise that their descendants between the two of them, Sarah and Abraham, would number the stars of the sky. Yet, Sarah said, it's been 10 years I am well past childbearing age. So what does she do? She sends in Hagar to sleep with Abraham. Now we all know it takes two to tango. So we assume that Abraham also agreed with having the same doubt as Sarah, uh, Sarah did. So Hagar goes in. She sleeps with Abraham. What happens? She gets pregnant. And then all of a sudden the scriptures say, and Sarah deals harshly with Hagar. Now, let me tell you, if reality TV was around back then, this would have been like the epic story, right? There was probably drama central going on here because back in this time, it was Sarah's responsibility, her primary uh, job to have children, to keep the lineage going. And so there's probably something in the back of her mind that thought, you know what? It's probably something wrong with Abraham. So if I send Hagar in and she doesn't get pregnant, then I'm going to know like it's him. Because back then they didn't understand infidelity. Though children were a blessing from God. So if you weren't having children, it was God withholding the blessing. And so all of a sudden Hagar goes in and, and she gets pregnant. And so what is Sarah going? Oh no. What if it's with me? And she deals harshly with Hagar. But let's put herself in Hagar's situation. Okay, um... First of all, I'm your servant, and I'm obeying you, and I'm going in and sleeping with your husband, and what you wanted to happen happened, and now you're mad at me, right? 
So she deals harshly with Hagar, and what does Hagar do? She takes off running. Now, here's where I want to stop for one minute, because Hagar was a product of her circumstances. She didn't choose to be a maidservant. She didn't choose to go in and sleep with Abraham. She didn't choose any of that. She was told to do that. She she was a servant. This was her job. She was required to do this. There was no choice in it for her. You see, God, man, Abraham and Sarah, took God's blessing in their own timing, and here stood Hagar, pregnant as a product of their doubt. Have any of you guys ever been a product of your circumstances? Your context of your story is just in disarray, and you had nothing to do with it. You didn't choose any of it. Maybe you came from infidelity. Maybe you came from rape. Maybe your parents are alcoholics. Maybe they're liars. Maybe there's addiction. All these past circumstances, and you go, I had nothing to do with this. I'm just a product of my circumstances. And a lot of time that we can think is that our circumstances define our past, that they also define our future. And we don't understand that we are worthy of something different. See, the thing is, is God didn't take Hagar's past and know what happened to her and say, ah, oh, that defines you. He says, no, I define you. And I'm still finding you worthy of the search. Because here's what happens. Hagar goes running. And we're going to jump into Genesis 16, verse 7 through 8. And it says, the angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness along the road to Shur. The angel said to her, Hagar, Sarah's servant, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah, she replied. Now, Sarai is the way it is here. Shortly after, God will change her name to Sarah. But it's easier just to refer to her as Sarah since that's what we know her as. You see, stopping right there, Hagar was from Egypt. At this time, Egypt does not know anything about the Lord. They weren't worshiping the Lord. In fact, they worshiped a million gods except the Lord. So the first Hagar has no experience with the Lord. And so everything that she's had to know about God is being taught to her or had been taught to her by Abraham and Sarah. But right away, she recognizes the Lord. I'm going to tell you, there is a lesson right in there because she wasn't brought up believing something but she chose to embrace the Lord anyways. And because she had an open heart and searching eyes, she saw God pursuing her. And she was able to immediately identify it. I have a 15-year-old daughter, and I remember when she was nine, and uh, we were, it was a day after her birthday, and we walked out of the, the church, and she just froze. Excuse me. And she said, Mom, there's a rainbow. And I'm like, yeah, there is promise. That's great. That's her name, promise. And um, she says, I knew God would give me a birthday present. I was just waiting for it. Excuse me. Sorry. And I just paused and I thought, man, she gets it. She had these open eyes where it was a day past her birthday, but it didn't matter. That was a gift directly from God because she had an open heart and searching eyes for the Lord. You see, the Lord goes to Hagar, and he asks her two questions, right? He says, where have you come from, and where are you going? Now, we know where she came from. She she came from Sarah's um, kind of clan, and we know where she was going. The scriptures tell us that she was going back to Egypt. Now, this is a 210-mile journey, and she is pregnant. I wouldn't want to do that. This is like desert territory, too. But here's the thing. So, first of all, God asked her, where have you come from, and where are you going? Do you think he really, like, didn't know? course not, right? He knew, but he wanted her to ponder it. Maybe that's some of our take home for some of us today, is maybe we need to go home with God and say, where have I come from? But Lord, where am I going? Because she answers the first part of that question. She says, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah, but she never answers that second part of that question. Could it be that she wanted God to answer the second part of that question? You see, if she were to run back to Egypt, even if she were to make it to Egypt, she would be considered a runaway slave to a woman who was probably, all her family was probably in slavery. She would have no one to go back to because they would all themselves be servants. She would have very limited options to either go back into slavery or to be kind of like a homeless, who knows what it was in that time period, but her options were very limited. And so I believe that she's like, Lord, tell me, where am I going? 
But then here's what the Lord says in Genesis 16, 9. He says, the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. I mean, if my heart, if I was Hagar, it would just like drop right then. Like, okay, Lord, you want me to do what? Like, do you not get it? They sent me in to sleep with Abraham. I had a, I'm pregnant. Like they wanted me to be, and now they're mad at me and they're dealing harshly with me. And you want me to go back and like submit myself to that? Hagar had to deny even her own desires. She would have to deny what she wanted. But then God says this. He says in verse 10 and 11, then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said, and you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. First blessing by the way, your descendants are going to outnumber you. They're, you're going to have a crazy amount of descendants. Second blessing, you're having a son. At this time, that meant a big deal. Sons would take care of their mothers. Sons could carry on lineages. But God doesn't stop there. He goes on to say in Genesis 16, 12, and we're just going to hit the first part of this verse. It says, the son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old. If Boys, if God ever told me before they were born that they would be untamed wild donkeys, I would have been like, redo, like, this is crazy. How am I supposed to deal with this, Lord? But it seems a little odd, but here's what I have to tell you. God is actually speaking Hagar's language. Because where Hagar came from in Egypt, this means that he would be a free man. To a woman who has been in captivity and only known to be a maidservant her entire life, God is saying, if you go back to Sarah and if you submit to her, there will be freedom in that obedience. How many of us need to hear that? There is freedom in obedience. When we obey God, we experience freedom. But not only that, there are blessings that follow. So again, we're going to stop for three minutes, and I want you guys to talk quickly, one to, two, three, one to two sentences per person. Where have you been obedient in the past and experienced the blessings of God because of that obedience? All right, ladies, we're going to bring it back again. I know it's a hefty question, right, for three minutes. But as we dig back into the scriptures, uh, we're going to go into Genesis 16, 13. Because this is what Hagar says. Because now she has a decision to make. All these blessings if she obeys. And guess what? She does choose to obey. But here's what she says. Therefore, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. She also said, have I truly seen the one who sees me? You see, what this is saying is she actually gave God a new name. The Hebrew word for you are the God who sees me is El Roy. She starts calling him El Roy. My El Roy, I've seen the God who sees me. And she becomes so excited, which this lets us know that God knew the cravings of her heart was to have a son who would be free. That she didn't even have to speak it, but he knew the desires of her heart. But she, she yells out, my El Roy, the God who sees me. And she goes back to Sarah and she submits. But her story is not done there. Obviously, we go through a couple years, um, and we don't know what exactly happens to Hagar. But we know she goes back to Sarah. And most likely, because she is raising Ishmael at the time, Abraham's only son, her life is probably pretty cush. She is, um, because not only, she's probably still a maidservant, but you have to understand she's under Abraham's protection. So she's like the top dog when it comes to maidservants, right? And so we jump to Genesis 21, and here we have Sarah is now has Isaac. God came through for this promise. And in her old age, at the age of 90, and Abraham is 100, they are holding Isaac, and they are having a, a weaning party. Now, we should have that, right? That sounds great for us ladies, right? So they're having a party because now Isaac is weaned. And here is 13-year-old Ishmael. And he is making fun, that's what the scriptures say, making fun of Isaac. And Sarah sees this. Now, let me tell you, anybody know any 13-year-old boys that like to make fun, right? Is it intentional? They think everything's funny. 
right? It could be the goofiest thing out there and they think it's hilarious. And so we have no idea if Ishmael was purposely making fun of Isaac or he was just joking around with a small little two-year-old boy. But either way, Sarah gets mad and she goes to Abraham and she says, send them off. I don't want him here anymore. And Abraham is a little bit torn because Ishmael is still his son. And Abraham goes back and he uh, just, God gives him confirmation that it's okay. And the next morning he sends Hagar and Ishmael off on a donkey with, not, don, not a donkey, just gives them food and water and sends them off. Now we're going to start at verse, in Genesis 21, verse 15. It says, when the water was gone, she put the boy in the shade of a bush. Then she went and sat down by herself about a hundred yards away. That's one full football field. I don't want to watch the boy die, she said, as she burst into tears. Let's just talk about Hagar. 13 years later, when the, when Sarah was treating her unfairly, she bolted, remember? All of a sudden, her same tendencies are back because what happens when she thinks her son's going to die? She bolts, right? She goes 100 football fields away from her son, and she forgets all those things that God promised, like descendants and freedom and all that. It doesn't matter because the boy's going to die. You see, can I just tell you, sometimes a lot of the things that we, don't get, we need to work on don't always get worked on when we're comfortable and cozy. Sometimes we have to go through trials, and all of a sudden we see these fault lines in our life that God goes, oh, yeah, that right there, that needs my touch. And that was Hagar's story. When the going gets tough, Hagar gets going. That's her. But here, this is what's so cool is God's patience. God didn't throw up his arms and go, seriously, Hagar, do you not know how I literally came and visited you before? And I totally showed up and I talked to you and I gave, I said you were having a son. You had a son. You were, you've been cozy. Like, don't you think I'd come through with you? You've been sitting all these years at ha- with Abraham and Sarah learning about me. Don't you know? But he didn't give up on her. He didn't throw up his arms and say, oh, I'm not going after you again. No, here's what happens in Genesis 21, 17 through 18. It says, but God heard the boy crying and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven. Hagar, what's wrong? Always asking her questions. Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go to him and comfort him for I will make a great nation from his descendants. In other words, Hagar, I need you actually to go do something for me. You have to walk back that hundred yards. And you know she was dehydrated even more than her son because any mama would give their boy more water than her. She walks, has to walk a football field and then sit down. And not only does she just sit there, she has to say, it's going to be okay. God's got this. Guess what? She does. And all of a sudden God opens up her eyes and they see a spring of water. You see, God's promises all came true. In fact, the Arab nation is actually said to stem from Ishmael. His descendants number the stars in the sky. God came through with her promise, but she had to obey. There's a scene in Runaway Bride, anybody love that movie? Where Julia Roberts hands this, this box to Richard Gere, and, she, and he opens it up, and it's this beat-up pair of running shoes, and he says, these are worn. And she says, I know they're mine. And he says, this is serious. I would love to imagine that maybe after all of Hagar's story, she realized that she could not outrun God. That he was crazy in love with her and that he would pursue her and he would always run faster than her. Here's what I have to tell you, ladies. You can't outrun him. He is searching after you. And if your eyes are open, if you're searching for him, you will always find him. We're not going to do the last question, but I want you to take this home and think about it your own. What are some of the lessons that you can learn from Hagar? Maybe it's keeping your heart open and your eyes searching. Maybe it's actually being obedient, following through with the obedience thing that he asked you. Maybe you feel like the blessings aren't coming, but you realize the obedience isn't coming either. Maybe it's grasping that you can't outrun him and stopping. Maybe it's discovering, discovering an area of your life where you are actually feeding the feeling of being unworthy of him. If I could give each of you one experience, it would be to have an experience with your El Roy, the God who sees you. He sees you in your comings and your, your goings. He knows those nights when you lay in bed and cry and you don't tell anybody about it. He knows those dreams that you're just terrified to speak out loud those fears that could give you a panic attack at thinking that it happened, it would happen. He knows everything about you. Your Elroy, 
the God who sees you, and he is searching after you, and you are worthy of that search. Let's go ahead and pray.